Good day everyone. We are going to talk today about rhabdomyolysis. We are going to talk about the definition, the pathophysiology, we will explain about the causes, we will have uh, the presentation and the physical examination findings, we will have a little bit of the diagnosis and investigations and management, and finally we will have the summary or the take home message. Let's begin with the definition of rhabdomyolysis. So it's basically a syndrome. The most important thing that it is characterized by muscle necrosis and release of the intracellular muscle constituents into the circulation. So this definition is basically giving you a brief picture about what happens in the pathophysiology of rhabdomyolysis. You will have elevated creatinine kinase, you will have muscle pain and, and uh, myoglobinuria. The presentation is very wide, you will have it from simple up to life-threatening conditions. So let's talk a little bit about the pathophysiology. So when you have here, let's begin with a, a simple drawing, okay? So we have here a muscle in the red color. So let's um, say this is a muscle, for example. Uh, so either you have um, decreased blood supply. So you have decreased blood supply. Okay. And as a result of that, you will have decrease in the ATP. So you, the muscle won't generate enough ATP. Or you have a direct muscle injury, okay, that will lead to rupture of the cell membrane. So you will have rupture of the cell membrane through direct injury, okay? So in the rhabdomyolysis, you will have either both of them, okay, coming along together, or one of them is enough to produce uh, the uh, rhabdomyolysis. So let's see what's gonna happen after this so as we said we will have atp depletion it's not enough to go into the demands of the muscle it will increase the intracellular calcium this intracellular calcium is also increased in the mitochondria and it will also be increased into the cytosol we'll have also here if you can see we will have the na k pump and you will have the calcium pump. Both of them will be dysfunctional in the case of rhabdomyolysis. So, so you will have here increase in the intracellular calcium. You will have also hypokalemia. So uh, you will have hypokalemia and hypercalcemia inside the cell um, or inside the muscle uh, cell. So let's go back. Okay, this is basically what I have explained. So you have here the ATP depletion and or direct muscle injury and rupture of the cell membrane. You will have increase in the intracellular calcium in the cytosol and mitochondria. You will have dysfunction of the pumps, the NAK pump and the calcium pump. This is the initial things. After that, you will have Activation of the proteases because of the calcium, okay, you will have um, activation of the proteases. These proteases will destruct the cytoskeleton, okay? When the cytoskeleton is uh, destructed, uh, all of the muscle constituents will go out. And uh, because of these injuries, the decrease in the ATP supply and the rupture uh, or the direct injury, you will have free radicals inside the cell, okay? So we'll have free ra radicals. When you have the cytoskeleton destruction, those free radicals will go into the blood and released into the circulation. So let's see here what happens next. So after the increased intracellular calcium, you will have activation of the intracellular protease. As we said, these proteases will uh, affect the cytoskeleton. So let's write here cytoskeleton. Okay, it will lead to mitochondrial dysfunction, increase in the muscle contractility, and this is because calcium increases the contractility of uh, any muscle. So increasing the intracellular calcium will lead to increased uh, contractility and production of the free radicals. So the final pathway will lead to muscle death. So this is what happens at the end. You will have muscle necrosis leading to release of the intracellular constituent into the circulation. Okay, so this is basically the pathophysiology of rhabdomyolysis. So this is um, 
This is a, a picture showing you what happens exactly in the uh, in the pathophysiology of rhabdomyolysis. So as we said here, when you have um, when you have a hypoxia or decrease in the blood supply, hypokalemia, we will talk about it, why and the causes, and some enzyme deficiencies. You will have the main thing, ATP depletion, an increase in the intracellular calcium, dysfunction of the pumps will lead to the uh, rhabdomyolysis. And finally, because of that, you will have deep, uh, deep breaths, okay? Or um, the waste of the muscles, the whole thing is coming out into the circulation. It will go to the kidney, Okay, so this is the kidney. The tubules on it will be blocked by these uh, waste, so it will lead to urinary obstruction, or as you say, um, decrease in the urine output, not obstruction, sorry. Uh, the urine output will, will be low, and sometimes it will give us uh, the myoglobin, the uh, myoglobin coming out of the muscle into the urine. Now, uh, the causes. So the causes are basically could be uh, classified in that way. So you have traumatic and non-traumatic. For the traumatic, we have muscle compression, and we will go for the other causes. The non-traumatic could be exertional, and it can be non-exertional. We will take each one and talk about it in a little bit detail. So let's begin with the traumatic muscle compression. So let's have a scenario that one, uh, a 60-year-old male came and had uh, a hip fracture, he fell down on the ground uh, very uh, forcefully. He had uh, the fracture. He cannot mobilize, and he had a coma on the ground. So we have this person in here, okay? He had a hip fracture, for example, in here, and he cannot move. So no movement, and he has a fracture, Okay, and he uh, had, um, had had the crush injury when he fell down. Okay, so all of these factors are considered traumatic. So he had crush injury, he went into coma, he went into immobilization. All of these uh, will lead to rhabdomyolysis and will lead to destruction of the muscle. So prolonged muscle compression or people who are suffering from compartment syndrome, all of these are uh, at risk of the um, rhabdomyolysis traumatic part. Let's go for the non-traumatic. First, we will begin with the exertional. So the exertional, either uh, there is the energy supply to the muscle is not enough to meet its demand, or uh, uh, not or, and you have the extreme exertion uh, or exertion under conditions of the muscle needing uh, oxygenation but the oxygenation in this condition is impaired. So either you have a normal muscle or you have an abnormal muscle. We will talk about it. So we have uh, an example of the non-traumatic uh, non exertional. It includes uh, the hypokalemia. Okay, for the hypokalemia, it is really important in here that we have to know that the K or the potassium plays a really important role in the blood supply. Okay, so when you have decrease in the blood supply, that's definitely will lead to hypokalemia and vice versa. So the potassium, it's a really important regulator for the blood flow to the muscle. So uh, when you have decrease in the potassium, you will have decrease in the blood supply, decrease in the ATP supplementation, and then you will have rhabdomyolysis. Another example, when you have the pathologic hyperkinetic movements, okay, in here, the pathologic hyperkinetic movement, for example, we have uh, generalized uh, seizures, amphetamine overdose, these people will have agitation and uh, we will ha they will have resistance and strains in the muscle that will increase the exertion of the muscle. So that will lead also to uh, rhabdomyolysis. Another causes is the metabolic, uh, uh, here you can see the metabolic myopathies. Uh, it's a really small percentage, so it's small. Uh, percentage of patients. However, you suspect it in patients who have recurrent episodes of rhabdomyolysis. So let's say that you have a patient coming to you after a marathon with an episode of rhabdomyolysis and he's 16 years old. After a few months, he had been into exertion in the school and he came again with rhabdomyolysis. So you, you should suspect in this patient uh, uh, metabolic myopathy and go for the specific investigation according to the genetics. 
Another uh, another thing is the um, thermal extremes and dysregulation. For example, you have here the heat stroke and environmental heat. You have the malignant hyperthermia. All of these will cause um, vasodilation and vasoconstriction sometimes when you have decrease in the uh, thermal um, or temperature is very low. So you take it as anything that increase the vasodilation, okay? or increase vasoconstriction all of these will lead to a uh, decrease in the blood supply to the muscle let's see how because of the vasodilation it will cause pooling of the blood okay that this is really uh, an important thing that vasodilation will uh, excessive vasodilation not the normal vasodilation excessive vasodilation will co cause pooling of the blood so this blood is going to the muscles so it will uh, cause rhabdomyolysis and uh, excessive vasoconstriction also less blood flow less atp uh, generation and therefore going to rhabdomyolysis Let's go to the non-traumatic non-exertional, the last class of the uh, rhabdomyolysis. It's basically drugs. So it is um, drugs and toxins, the most important things in here. So drugs and toxins, even the drugs, uh, even the prescription drugs like statins and antipsychotics, as you can see in here, antihistamine and colchicine. So all of these can cause um, uh, rhabdomyolysis. How, for example, uh, people who are taking excessive alcohol and taking opioid overdose, any CNS depressant, uh, can cause coma, and from the coma you will have immobilization, and from the immobilization you will have uh, rhabdomyolysis. Other things, an important question for the exam is the direct, uh, for example, what are the direct myotoxins? myotoxins okay for the direct myotoxins it is considered statins and uh, uh, and the colchicine okay colchicine both of them are considered uh, as uh, direct toxins to the uh, muscle uh, causing rhabdomyolysis uh, another thing that can cause rhabdomyolysis is drug-drug uh, uh, drug interactions between uh, the, um, uh, the statins and some antibiotics. For example, so you have here statins that could interact with macrolides. What are some examples of ma macrolides? Uh, we have erythromycin, clarithromycin, and uh, some other micro macrolide uh, antibiotics. These macrolide antibiotics causes uh, decrease in the clearance of um, decrease in the clearance of the statins uh, from the blood. Uh, another thing is uh, the drug induced uh, seizures, agitations, and dystonic reaction. You know that uh, some uh, so some of the drugs, for example, alcohol, can cause um, can cause drug induced seizures uh, and uh, causes agitation. So that will lead to increased risk of the rhabdomyolysis. Another thing is the toxins. Uh, for example, we have the venoms here are the most important ones. Uh, they do, they, uh, the main action of it, that they decrease the ATP production directly in the muscle. So they, uh, there is no sufficient ATP uh, production. So this is for the classification of the causes of rhabdomyolysis for now. And then uh, we will go for the um, infections first before we move on. Uh, the infections, uh, we have HIV, we have many, many, many infections. But the most important thing is toxic shock syndrome, the TSS. The toxic shock syndrome, it is caused by strep and staph. Uh, both of them uh, excrete uh, the exotoxins inside the blood and uh, they cause dehydration, rigors, and fever. All of these will lead to rhabdomyolysis in susceptible uh, patients, okay? Uh, another thing uh, we said is the electrolyte disturbance for people who have hypokalemia, but uh, hyp uh, hypokalemia, hyperphosphatemia, and other um, electrolyte disturbances, it's not that much important. Uh, for the inflammatory and miscellaneous, they are very rare to happen, and it's not that much important. But for example, when you have a patient with status asthmaticus, he's using a lot of his accessory muscles and diaphragm muscle that can lead to uh, rhabdomyolysis. Um, 
but it's not considered that much uh, non-exertional. There is uh, overlap between it and the miscellaneous. Uh, for the endocrinopathies, for example, you have hypothyroidism. Uh, this this uh, predisposed to uh, rhabdomyolysis. Okay, so let's go now to the diagnosis, uh, sorry, for the presentation and physical examination. This is a summary of what I have said previously about the causes so, uh, and what are the most commonly reported causes in each category. For example, here we have the trauma, uh, sorry, uh, we have here the uh, trauma category. The most important thing is the crush syndrome in it. And therefore, you go for the other categories to know the most important reported causes. Okay, let's go for the presentation. So basically, it's a triad, a triad of three things, muscle weakness, muscle pain, and dark urine, or what we call the cola-colored urine. The muscle pain is not necessary to be there. It's sometimes absent, and when it is present, some, uh, it appears to be in the proximal muscle mostly, in the shoulders and the hip muscles. Other general symptoms include malaise, fever, tachycardia, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, decreased urine output. When you go for the physical examination, so you have, uh, when you check for the muscle area, you will have tenderness in the patient, you will check for swelling, you uh, will notice some weakness in the muscle sometimes, limb induration, and some skin changes. You have to check in the skin changes for any ischemic tissue or any ischemic changes. You check also for blisters for uh, an infection signs. Now let's go to the diagnosis and investigation. So the diagnosis, the most important one is the elevated serum CK or creatinine kinase. Let's talk a little bit about the creatinine kinase. So you have here the CK, okay, and it is the most sensitive. However, it's not uh, that much specific for rhabdomyolysis, and it is the most reliable uh, for muscle injury. Uh, it starts, it starts uh, to rise in about 12 hours, okay, and the peak, it reaches the peak for about 24 to 36 hours, so 36 hours. And after that, after the treatment, it starts to decline by a rate of 30 to 40%. 40%, okay? Uh, uh, and uh, so it, during the three to five days after treatment, it will start to decline. Three to five decline after treatment, okay? Uh, if you have failure to decline after the three to five days, that suggests that you have continuous muscle injury. Continuous injury. So you have to check in the patient if he has compartment syndrome, if he has still uh, uh, been in injury uh, of the muscle. You have to check for the any other uh, trauma for the muscles in any different areas of the patient. Another thing uh, is the urine urinalysis uh, and the dipstick. You have to check for the heme, for the RBCs, for the myoglobin, as we said, the uh, dark cola colored urine. However, it's only positive in 50%, so only positive in 50% of the patients, so it's not that much specific. Other investigations will include uh, for uh, electrolyte, for example, calcium, uh, potassium, phosphate, and you can also check for the creatinine uh, levels. For the complications, I won't talk that much about it because we have discussed it a little bit in the causes. So you will have the fluid and electrolyte imbalance, hypokalemia, hypercalcemia. You will have other uh, manifestation of electrolyte imbalance because, because of the renal injury. So you can have acute kidney injury and this is very serious. Uh, and another thing just to mention about the CK, when it is elevated to be uh, 15,000, unit per liter, this is an indication or not an indication, sorry, a, a predictive value for the acute kidney injury. Uh, the other complication could be compartment syndrome, disseminated intravascular coagulation, with, which appears to be with the toxic shock syndrome. For the management, the management is basically correct the fluid and electrolyte abnormalities, remove and treat the cause, for example, the toxin or the drugs, treat the compartment syndrome with elevating the leg firstly, or not the leg, the area that is injurated and has the injury. If uh, it failed uh, in that way, you can go for uh, fasciotomy. 
Here is just a summary about what we have said about uh, rhabdomyolysis. What are the side effects? You have kidney damage, and it is the most important one. What are the causes? Uh, the, a little bit about the um, pathophysiology, about the dark urine or the cola, uh, cola um, colored uh, urine. Here is the summary that we have. Uh, the manifestations and complications is basically because of the cell death and release of the intracellular constituents. We said about the causes, and this is a very important point that are the most uh, uh, common clinical condition associated with it is trauma, and we have immobilization, sepsis, vascular and cardiac surgeries are the most reported causes of rhabdomyolysis. The clinical manifestation, we talked about it, about the CK elevation to be more than 5,000 and how's the criteria of diagnosis. Uh, we also talked about the uh, how to treat the, uh, the, the rhabdomyolysis, that we have to correct the fluid and electrolyte, and we have to remove uh, the cause. So here are uh, the references that we used. Uh, we used two articles from UpToDate, one from the PubMed, and uh, we used a little bit about Kumar, it was useful. Thank you for watching. We hope this video was beneficial. Good day.